Support for this episode of Judaism Unbound comes from the Diller Teen Tikkun Olam Awards. Help shine a light on the next generation of inspiring young Jewish leaders. Each year, the Diller Teen Tikkun Olam Awards recognize 15 extraordinary Jewish teenagers from across the United States with an award of $36,000 to honor their initiatives to help change the world. You can nominate a teen today or they can apply directly by January 7th. Visit www.dillerteenawards.org slash unbound to learn more. That's www.dillerteenawards.org slash unbound. This is Judaism Unbound, episode 300. You, yes, you are a Jewish leader. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Dan Liebenson. And I'm Lex Rofberg. And as we just said, this is episode 300. Lex, when we started this podcast, well, I don't think I thought at all about the number 300, but, you know, the idea that we've made it to episode 300 is remarkable. I will admit, I've thought more about the 300th episode than either the 200th or the 400th, because 300 is, of course, the movie with, like, Leonidas and Sparta and all that stuff. I don't know if that makes us Spartans, but it's pretty exciting that we have reached that momentous number. All right. Well, I want to come back to this 300 question in a minute. But before we do, uh, we just want to take this opportunity especially to say that we would not be at episode 300 were it not for you, the listeners, actually listening. We wouldn't have bothered to keep doing this if there were no listeners out there. And, uh, you know, nobody would have given us any money, so we wouldn't (laughs) have been able to do it. So it really is thanks to you. And we want to continue to thank you and thank you and thank you for making this podcast possible by listening to it and by being part of it. So one thing that we, I think, haven't really asked folks to do in a while is to go on whatever podcast app you use, Apple Podcasts or whatever it might be, and leave us a review. It definitely helps with the algorithm so that people will find the podcast when they're looking for a Jewish podcast or where they're looking for various topics. So if you would do that, that would be fantastic. Another thing that we always love and need is for folks to support us financially. Something like $5 a month would be great. And you can do that through this monthly contribution, just signing up to give a monthly $5 gift. And that makes it easy. You don't have to think about it again. And you can do that through our website directly or through Patreon. And either of those you can find at our website, www.judaismunbound.com slash donate. And on our website, this is a super exciting thing that we're ready to announce. You will now also find Judaism Unbound merch for the first time. Judaism Unbound merchandise. There's a store. You can buy t-shirts, you can buy mugs, you can buy tote bags. And we would love to find out from you, are there things that you are dying to have the Judaism Unbound logo on that are not there? We'll add it. Head over to judaismunbound.com slash merch, or just go to the Judaism Unbound website homepage, and you can find the links there, and you can finally adorn yourself in Judaism Unbound logos all over. Yes, adorn yourself in Judaism Unbound, now and forever. On the adorning front, actually, we uh, just recently saw an amazing example of adorning on Mm -hmm. Facebook from two Judaism Unbound guests. Jericho Vincent put on Facebook that they have are in the process of creating a set of tefillin, which are, you know, I think we've laughed about this before, translated into English as phylacteries, but that is of no help whatsoever. But those are those black boxes that uh, often you see Jews will wrap themselves on their on their arm and on their head for praying. And in those black boxes are traditionally found a particular set of texts from the Torah. And what Jericho Vincent has done is commissioned a scribe, a traditional scribe, to write those texts, but using the text from another of our guests, Yael Kanarek's version of the Torah, that was Torah Ta, where she has reversed all the genders of everyone, of all the genders in the Bible. And so now that rewritten Bible is now being made into a very traditional type of object in a fascinating way. So we're really excited. We were really, I was super excited to see that. Yeah. And to be clear, like, we're definitely not taking any credit for this. And I know that's not what you were meaning to do, Dan, but I I think that you're right to shout out that Facebook post from Jericho. There is, there's something afoot. There's something happening. And there's clearly this bubbling up of energy around Jewish creativity, Jewish ritual through progressive lenses of various kinds which can include something like rewriting the text of the Torah with different approaches to gender. Um, 
as we sort of sit here and reflect to some extent on where we've been as a podcast and where we're going as a podcast, I think that when we started, it's not that there was none of that energy, but there was less like and once just to reemphasize and reemphasize this i'm not saying we started and that was therefore created it's not like it's it's not our sole creation that this energy is there but it's now almost a given when we have guests on and we're talking about whether it's creativity with jewish art whether it's different new approaches to ritual activism through jewish lenses like it's just sort of an unspoken or occasionally explicitly spoken thing that like there's a whole lot of this happening yeah. all around the country for us in the United States, even to some extent all around the world. And that's funky. That's great. That's what we want to continue happening. And from our perspective, that's what will lead to the Judaism's plural that we want and need in a time of transition, which we've been saying all the way from the beginning, like in a time of transition where Judaism has in many ways crashed, where the Judaisms that we've inherited are not working for a lot of people. So we've been hoping since the beginning of this podcast for a flowering, a budding, um, choose your flower metaphor, I guess. That's where my mind is today. Um, but a budding of energy around Jewish creativity. And, you know, we've we've got it. Some of that energy we see through the explosive growth of something like Svara, right? in the last few years, they've gone from, you know, a small project that, you know, the people really in the know in queer Jewish life knew about to one of the, the leading projects of Jewish life today um, to watch organizations founded by and for Jews of color. Like, these are things that are exploding in the most positive ways right now. But there's also Jewish creativity, Jewish energy, flowering, budding, in spaces that aren't like Jewish organizations, right? Like that that are Jews doing stuff, but sort of directed outward towards not just Jews, towards the world. And we spoke about that a little bit recently, but Dan, I'm like, I'm curious how you'd reflect on that over these years and whether you would sort of co-sign this energy that, that I think is buzzing all around us. Yeah, I so first of all, I totally agree. Of course, that we we're not taking credit for any of that. We're just we've we're reflecting on it. We're we're part of something. We've always wanted to be part of of something, and it wasn't clear three hundred episodes ago whether the something that we wanted to be part of existed. We had a sense that it existed. We had a sense that it could exist even more, and we wanted to highlight it and try to give some energy and some juice to it. I hope that we've done that. I mean, I, I hope that there is a certain amount of credit that we can take for some of the energy, as you say, only in that, not that we want to take credit, but just that that was our, that's our function. That, that was what we were trying to do, was to <laughs> try to figure out how to bring some energy into something and how to say, actually, you, you think that these things are all disconnected, but actually they're connected. And to sort of reflect on some of the connective tissue that we're seeing and maybe in reflecting on it, giving some more of that connective tissue, which is why I'm especially excited to see things being created that are bigger and more exciting and more daring than what anybody could do alone. And by the way, I don't know if it's connected to this or not, but I meant to say it earlier. One of the really exciting things that happened in the last week is that we had our first mention in the New York Times. <laughs> and uh, that I'm giving you the credit. That was you, Lex. Uh, but you were quoted in the New York Times Magazine in this article. No, about... no. Sorry to interrupt, but the credit goes to Mark Tracy, who was the author of the article and who and who is a listener. So, Mark, oh, you're probably listening right now. And and I say that just because, like, we're at a point where where that is something that's possible, where people who listen to us have of their own volition, like, found ways to channel the show into different directions. But yeah, New York Times, we're we're there now. Well, and and what was and what that article was talking about. I mean, that article in a very in the most narrow way, the article was talking about a letter that had been written by rabbinical students. They were writing a letter that was critical of of Israel and and uh, there was all kinds of controversy about it. People saying they should be more supportive of Israel and them saying, "No, we're trying to bring the prophetic tradition to to bear on this on this question and we this is our function to criticize Israel. So whatever you feel about the substance of that, you were quoted Lex as somebody who is reflecting on what we're seeing and you said something which was just true that whatever you want to say about 
these folks and what they're doing, these are people who will be, and you later clarified, I think, on Twitter that they already mm. are leaders of American Judaism. And so you have to take that seriously and you can't be dismissive of that. But what that was for me was a sign that at least in a certain world of trying to reflect on what's happening in the Jewish world today, that Judaism Unbound, a podcast, you know, our podcast was being taken seriously as a commentator. You know, other commentators were also listed who are, you know, professors and people that have been around a long time. So I was very excited to be in that company just as being noted that there are elements, by the way, Jewish Currents also, mm -hmm. as an organization that is positioned maybe in this kind of progressive or cutting edge or bleeding edge, whatever you want to call it, area of Jewish reimagining. And that there are certain organizations whose function is to kind of try and reflect on what we're seeing and give it some language and give it some energy. And so I was excited that people are recognizing that because that's that's something that we were trying to do all along and specifically went in the New York Times. That's very fun. I'm glad you brought up that article for a few reasons. I mean, first off, yeah, there's, I was quoted with one with one quick quote, which I, I do stand behind, but basically saying that the folks who signed on to this letter are sort of future leaders of American Judaism. And what's so funny about that and is that I, I have a general pet peeve with that phrasing of leaders of tomorrow or future leaders. Um, uh, clearly, I slipped and I said it myself. It wasn't a misquote. What, the, the reason I bring it up is because so often we talk about what the future of Judaism is, right? Where, where we're going. And in doing that, we imply that sort of Judaism is what the main institutions of Judaism are doing now. You know, the big synagogues or pick your, pick your acronym organizations out there that have lots of funding and have been around for a long time. Like we sort of presume that, ah, that's Judaism. And then people doing things creatively with new assumptions, new presumptions are future Judaisms. And, mm -hmm. and we've done that a lot. And it's true in many ways, right? Like we can't, we can't sit here and say that like the, the mainline institutions that we want to push, we can't say those aren't Judaism. They, they are. But what I would claim is that the people signing onto those letters, I mean, the, the Israel Palestine piece of that is, you know, one piece of it, right? Um, it's an illustrative piece because I think it's a perfect example of how rapidly, how drastically the American Jewish community can and does shift on all sorts of things. I think this issue, Israel-Palestine, we're seeing when a hundred rabbinical students, which there's only there's only a few hundred, there's only like 500 non-Orthodox rabbinical students, period. And so when a hundred of them sign on to a statement that talks about Israel-Palestine through this prism, through talking about ways in which the occupation really is a moral disaster, that's showing not a shift that is going to happen, but one that has already. But the, the other piece is that the article, it goes into this ecosystem that we're talking about. It talks about, like you said, Svara and Jewish Currents, and it mentions us, and it mentions a few other organizations. These are also present tense, not future tense, already holding down the fort for an excited, energized set of American Jews, whose strength I still am like learning to adjust to. Like, I still think of this world as like a small little corner. Mm. But when mm -hmm. you've got six, ten, what, pick your number of different institutions, some holding down the fort, representing and speaking up on behalf of Jews of color and others creating Torah learning spaces for queer Jews and others that are, you know, upending questions around Zionism and anti-Zionism and asking and framing those differently. Like, and all of them are sort of in conversation with each other. And the article talks about them roughly as like the Jewish left, which I think is fair. Like, I think that's mm -hmm. true. What's interesting is there's a way in which, you know, I almost – it's not that I, I think that this ecosystem is now like a new denomination. I, I, I wouldn't frame it that starkly. But there's a way in which Svara and Jewish Currents and us – and Amud and Dues of Color Initiative. And like, I don't know, like we could go down the list of all these projects. They're working from a set of the shared purposes and goals. I and mean, you hear people talk about sort of the movement, the Jewish left. And I don't know, it excites me that that part of that movement is not only sort of a political repositioning, whether it's around Israel or other things, it's that we're actually repositioning 
how we think of Judaism itself, like what it is, mm-hmm. our agency as Jews to shape it and create it, not merely to inherit it. One thing that I just wanted to note about the article was I, I really liked the way it ended, which I don't have it in front of me, so I don't remember it exactly, but it was basically one of the rabbinical students was quoting one of the prophets and saying that basically many of the prophets are they're critical of, quote, the government of Israel, meaning the government of Israel of their time, you know, which were the kings of Israel. And the whole idea of the prophets is that they're often, whenever they're being critical of how things are going, which is a lot of the time, you have to understand that they're criticizing the current government of, of Israel as, as it was at that time. I mean, I'm mean, not using the right word, but just, you know, by analogy. And so, like, there's nothing wrong with criticizing the government from our tradition. In fact, that is, that mm-hmm. is our tradition big time. I would really like to go through the prophets and systematically make a list of quotations that would get them to be not invited to speak at a major Jewish organization <laughs> today. You know, you think about, remember that, that Thomas Jefferson Bible where he cuts out all the stuff that's about like uh, supernaturalism. And mm-hmm. so it's like a Swiss cheese Bible. I wonder what you would be left with if you cut out all the parts of the prophets where they're making a quote that if they had said it today about a Jewish or, you know, about, about Israel or, or not yeah. only Israel, you know, it's about a whole host of things would get them to be uninvited from, you know, a Jewish conference. I think you wouldn't be left with much. But I, I want to go back to what, what you were saying about, you know, looking back on the 300 episodes. The way that I'm trying to think this through, and I think the article is consistent with this, and I think that this, there's something here that, that we need to more fully describe. We're not necessarily trying to influence people to be different Jewishly than the way they want to be or they thought they should be. I'm not saying I'm against that, but I don't think that that's our primary function. I think our primary function is to say that people already are this way. They're sort of being told either directly or indirectly that the way that you want to be Jewish is not the right way. And I think that what we or what those of us who are called the Jewish left often are actually doing is just saying, no, no, no. What you're doing is a Jewish thing. Uh, like you said earlier, it's not, we're not saying it's the only Jewish thing. We're not trying to say that the organizations that are doing things that we don't like, for example, are not Jewish organizations. We're saying that the opposition to that or the desire to do something else is also a Jewish thing. And then from there, it, it might go on to, to take it further and to say, once we have a critical mass of people and organizations that together see themselves as um, representing a way to be Jewish in a way that otherwise or earlier would have maybe been seen as wrong. And now we have this critical mass that says this is right. Now we can say, OK, now let's uh, open the doors. Now, now maybe let's invite other people who weren't he- already here to say, oh, actually, I like that right. way better. So come, so come in. I'm imagining a certain kind of person. So there are many of these people. So w- for generations, you know, you've had organizations that sustain themselves through donations and such, right? OK, I'm not, this is not like a big funding tangent, I promise. Um, <laughs> but there's like, there's people who, you know, they have a generally warm relationship to Judaism, how much they're going to Jewish spaces, like not a lot. But there are people out there who want to play a role in supporting sort of, in rough terms, Judaism or American Judaism, or if you're locally, you know, what your city's Judaism. And for for a long, long, long time, those people have given funding, if they have the ability to give funding, to things like local synagogues or things like the Federation or things like national bodies that are sort of Jewish American organizations. I'm imagining a person similarly situated to those folks in 50 years. I think that a person who just like, they're not spending all their time in Torah study and Talmud study, but like they're interested in Jewish stuff, right? Like, I actually think that the trajectory that we're on right now is such that like that person could be giving their annual donation to things like Svara or things like the Jews of Color Initiative. Mm -hmm. Just because I I truly think those are on a pathway towards potentially being not only, you know, nice Jewish projects, but like potentially central 
binding agents of Jewish life generally. I mean, they're not members of things like the Conference of Presidents of major American Jewish organizations or whatever. Spoiler alert, I think that bodies like that are going to be less important and already are less important than they once were. But like, I'm not convinced that what we are viewing or what we're a part of is that a bunch of new projects are like getting admitted to an existing mm-hmm. conversation. I, I think potentially there is a changing of the guard happening. And once again, I'm not saying those other organizations more ma- with that go back a longer period of time or that are more conservative in their politics. I'm not saying they're not Jewish. I do think that the energy, the passion, the magnitude, the, the amount of stuff that is happening on any given day online and in person, I am excited about that. I, I do want to reflect a little notch more on what I said about like leaders of Judaism, because there's another angle I want to like push myself on, because that phrasing, right? Like we're talking about a bunch of rabbinical students, and I said that they are the future leaders of Judaism, or maybe they're already leaders of Judaism. I agree with that, and I agree with it most if the if the premise is that one holds leadership in quotes of Judaism, not by virtue of a title, not by like virtue of being a rabbi. I think that it's important to say, especially on our show, that the people who are leading Judaism now and always and in the future are not just those who are given titles or earn titles of leadership. It's people who are creating art. It's people who are pulling together a random event in their spare time that isn't their their primary job, but they're but they're pouring their heart and soul into bringing eleven people together for a tubishvat thing or a Purim thing. That's leadership of Judaism. And I flash back to the very first few podcasts we had where we t- where I distinguished between the Jewish community in quotes, like the idea that the Jewish community is the set of organizations that call themselves Jewish projects, as opposed to the Jewish population, like all all Jews. And and I would now broaden it to say all Jews and all people even if they're not Jews, who are part of a shared Jewish sort of civilizational project. And, you know, there's a part of me that wants to just upend the whole idea of a leader. Like, I don't know that we need to use that word leader so much. But for the time being, noting the shifts that we've seen even in the in the last few years of who is at the forefront of American Judaism is big. And by the way, I won't go down a tangent of like how so much of this is online, but I think it matters that a lot of this has occurred in a digital context and has accelerated through COVID. I do want to go in that tangent. I was actually about to, but I but before so before I do that, I I, I do want to say like I, I don't know if this is how you intended that quote, but the way that I took it, the way that I read it was it was less you saying these are leaders in the way that, you know, you affirm this definition of leader. The way that I took the quote was like, you people out there who think that this is some fringe element, Mm -hmm. you know, that's not, these are the people that you think of as leaders. You know, these are the people that that are going to be leading your congregation. These are people that are going to be leading the organizations that you think of as what a leader is, or at the very least, these are people who are going to have the title rabbi Mm -hmm. from the institutions that you accept that are that you're going to have to acknowledge are, are leaders because that's how you see leadership, you know, and that, and that you're saying, like, don't think of this as something fringe. On the digital part, though, I, I wanted to pick up on what I thought you were saying earlier, too, that if you think about your average Jew on the street today, and if and when that person decides, hey, I'm interested in having some kind of Jewish experience on a, let's call it like a national or international level, Meaning I want to have a kind of Jewish experience that's not available in my local community, but that I'm going to, I could go to a conference, I could go online, I could do whatever. Most of those people are going to go online because that's the easiest thing to do and the most straightforward thing to do. And what they're going to find there usually is going to be something that was not created by a large organization that's been around for a hundred years. What they're going to find there is something that was created by somebody representing a much smaller organizational footprint. So I think that if you look at the digital space, like we've talked about in the past as this new land to which the Jews are migrating, then it's already the case that the main proprietors on that land are 
the, our folks from this new world of people that we're talking about, whether that's not only leftists, because there are also things on the right, but they tend to be put out there by either small organizations or individual people. And there's something really important there. And that's when there is a new space for innovation is that it's going to be full of startups because it's not a big enough sort of exciting enough market yet for the larger organizations. Eventually, it will become big and exciting enough for them to come over. But by then, likely, the startups have already uh, built such a foothold and are already growing and are not small anymore that the large organizations can't really break in. And we'll see if that happens. I mean, I by saying it, I, I'm potentially mm -hmm. inviting some of the larger organizations to get in faster. But the theory would suggest that even with an invitation from us, they're not going to do it because it's just not worth enough of their while right now to put enough investment into it. And that that's already happening. So when we say that these are the leaders of Judaism, there is a certain place where Judaism is happening online, but not only online. I'm trying to say that it's, mm -hmm. it's a phenomenon when people across borders are seeing themselves as connected to one another. I think that's happening more in this new uh, space where those folks are already the leaders than it is in, in the kind of old line institutions. I'm going to do something I don't do that often on the show, but I'm going to reference this week's Torah portion. And I don't do it because, you know, we release episodes and they come out sometime and then they're out there forever. So like a lot of you are listening to this in the future and it's a different Torah portion. But as this episode is released, the Torah portion is Vayetze, which is a fascinating name, but I'm not really talking about the name. It, it means like, and he will exit or leave it's talking about Jacob, who goes on this sort of journey. He says something funky, which is, huh, this place was sacred. This, this place is sacred, and I didn't know. This place that I am right now, Jacob being I. He thought he was just on the road. Yeah, he thought he was just, but like, surprise, this place we are, everyone, in your phone right now or on your car radio or whatever version of digital you are inhabiting as you listen to this podcast, like this place was sacred or is sacred. And we, it took us a while to know. Hmm. It, it took us a while to realize that this is somewhere. It is a somewhere. And wow, huh? I guess it, it's sacred and we didn't realize it. We thought that it was the anti-sacred in many ways. I mean, I, one shift that is really palpable between now and when we first launched the podcast is I truly don't hear people saying something anymore that they that they really were starkly like six years ago, which is like the internet is a threat. It is like actively damaging to Jewish communities. I do hear people saying like there's things to fear. By the way, in this Torah portion, another thing that's that Jacob says is how awesome, how Nora in Hebrew is this mm. place, talking about the same place. How mm -hmm. awesome is it? Nora is also how terrifying. Awful. It, yeah. yeah, how awful. Awesome, awful. It, it, that's kind of what's happening linguistically. But Jewish community equally happens online and off. This place that we inhabit, which is to say the digital world, is a place and it's sacred and we didn't realize it. And I say we really – like we didn't even realize when we launched how true that was. It took us five years – of our existence to even think to do a Zoom, uh, four years, to even think to do a gathering in Zoom. That's now like a, a standard event as people do stuff. It's like we had recording sessions in Zoom, but we, you know, we, we didn't think of that. We didn't know it was sacred. Now we know. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. given that we know, we now have to revision everything in line with the fact that Almost all Jews who are, you know, doing Jewish, to use a funny phrase, almost all of them or us who are doing Jewish, the place that we're doing it is just as likely to be digital as offline. And we've even reached a place that are like, I'm pretty deep in a lot of Facebook groups. And like, there's people that I've never met offline. And I'm not, I'm not even, you know, friends with them on social media, but we share enough spaces that I feel like we're neighbors. Mm -hmm. I, I encounter them in different kinds of Jewish settings. And we've started to sculpt a situation where like we actually have kind of neighborhoods online mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. they overlap and they're different. But like there's ways in which, you know, you run into people. Oh, 
you're at this Zoom service. I didn't know you'd be here on the high holidays. I like I went to a random, uh, not random. I went to Jewish Studio Project's awesome Zoom services, and there were like four or five people there who I had no idea were going to be there. Some of them were in the Bay Area where Jewish Studio Project's based. Some of them were in other places. I was like, oh, nice to run into you. In the same way that you, oh, social hall before services. Oh, it's nice to see you. Uh, I'm I'm struck by the fact that we are having this 300th episode in a week where we are called in our text to think about the sacredness of places that we didn't realize were sacred. By the way, I think that that's a way in which folks who spend less of their time online are not... I think there's a failure of imagination at their peril in the sense that folks have said to me, you know, almost as a truism, that, well, of course you can't create the kind of community online that we have offline. And I kind of think, like, if you think that, then you think that the people who are not there at the community offline, you think that they're gone. You know, you think that they've assimilated, in quotes, (laughs) or you think that they have left or something. But really, they have just gone to a different place where they are having community and they are building a new approach to Judaism and they are having spiritual experiences and they are talking to each other and creating kinds of funky new combinations together. And you don't know that any of that is happening. So from your insider's perspective, you're panicked that we're getting smaller and smaller. And if we're, and since we're the only game in town, we're getting smaller and smaller means Judaism is dying when actually just, it's like, I mean, you know, there's a joke that somebody goes up to heaven and they're getting a tour of heaven and, you know, they're telling, well, this is where this religion is. This is where this religion, this is where this religion is. This is where this religion is. And then there's a wall and they hear voices on the other side of the wall. And they say, what are those voices on the other side of the wall? And they, the, the person giving the tour says, shh, that's this other religion. They think they're the only ones up here, you know? And, um, and I kind of feel like there's something going on. Like there's this whole party going on behind a wall and people don't, realize that, I mean, I guess it's the opposite of that joke. Like the joke is actually on the people that are on the main, quote, the main side of the wall, because the the real big party is happening on the the more hidden side of the wall. So I feel like there's something like that's, that's 300 episodes later. Like that's one of my conclusions that even we who were on this train, were actually a little bit focused in the wrong place about like where the technology might bring us. And the exciting place about where the technology potentially brings us is much closer to what we already knew in an interesting way. As much as our world is changing and folks are creating Jewish communities and Jewish initiatives and et cetera that are awesome, there's still, even as all that's happening, there still is this like looking over the shoulder at what the main institutions are doing, what the oldest legacy kinds of projects are doing, synagogues, federations, et cetera. And like as much as this amazing, inspiring, empowering stuff is coming to be, no matter how much of it there is, it's just sort of eternally alternative. It's like eternally, ah, there's synagogues and you could also do this other stuff if the synagogues aren't your favorite. So I, I, I often ask our guests, like, what's your frustration that led you to start X, Y, or Z organization, because that's, I think, often really important to get a lens on what people are struggling with and what they are seeking to remedy. For us, there still is this sense that the people in the main places, they're sort of doing the main Jewish thing and others are sideline characters. The people in yeshivas, the traditional kind, in Mm -hmm. centers for Jewish learning that are not also for unlearning, they're sort of holding down the fort. And then for those who don't love that, they can eventually get to a place where maybe they create their own stuff. But you sort of – you must go through a frustration with the main thing in order to Mm -hmm. get to that creativity place. And what I so pine for is a Jewish world where actually the un part, the un part of our name, both unbound, Judaism unbound and un yeshiva, it would sort of not make sense to people because all of Judaism had become more liberated, more – open to contributions from all of its members, more excited about shifts moving forward and not resistant to change in the ways that it so often is. Like the Anyashiva is trying to create a way, a pathway for people to get really deep into Jewish tradition, history, questions, culture, all of it, 
not for the purpose of becoming, you know, a leader of whatever those synagogues or a, a professional for one of those organizations. Like, I actually look, if people come to our on yeshiva and at the end of the day, they realize they really want to work in Jewish life. Like, that's great. That's that's like a great thing. And I mean that. It's not really why we're doing it. Like, what we're doing is we want to create an ecosystem and the on yeshiva's purpose is to help us get to a situation where we are rethinking those questions of leadership, of of authority, of power, really, in Jewish life. And um, I, I'm not bringing this up to be like a plug, but it's cool that in our first semester of it this fall, we've actually started to see that. Like, like my, my – Dan, you and I actually we, – we haven't talked a ton about – the success stories, the the like exciting moments in our classes. But I'll just say like the Discord group in my Jewish discontinuity class is like popping all the time with people sharing amazing resources, like amazing ideas for the future of Judaism. And these are not folks who are in this class because they want to necessarily become a rabbi or or even some other Jewish educator, cantor, or anything like that. It's people who just are excited that Judaism – has this treasure trove of material that we can play with ourselves and mobilize in new ways. This is uh, goes to a place that I don't always like to go, which is with Hebrew, but yeshiva in Hebrew means to sit. And so an unyeshiva would be about standing. And I like the idea that you were talking about people who are taking this knowledge to the streets, right? And this is not about people, this is not about an ideal where people sit in a house of study for years and years and, and study. This is an ideal where people come in for a few minutes, a few hours and study, and then go back out into the streets or into their homes or into their families or into their creativity. And they take that knowledge and they walk with it. They don't, they don't sit, you know, so they, there's so many, and I, and I'm not, I'm saying that not to be cute. I'm saying that in part to reference back to our very first episode where we started to play out the meaning of the word unbound in ways that we hadn't fully thought through when we came up with a name. And I kind of feel like the same thing is happening with Anyashiva now. And I also just want to say that there's like a positive element, meaning like when I look at the word unbound, I tend not to see it as not bound. I see unbound as like a, po I don't see it as the, the, the negation of a, of a positive thing. I see it as a positive concept in its own right. Meaning like we don't think of unbound as not bound. We think of unbound as like free, right? As like, as like really um, just can do anything. And I also want to think about how unyeshiva will get to a point where it doesn't mean not a yeshiva. It on yeshiva becomes a new word, so like yeshiva. I mean, yeshiva technically means sitting, but nobody really thinks of a yeshiva as a sitting. They think of it as a house of study. So I wonder if one day on yeshiva will just have a meaning in, it, in, it, in itself, and that meaning will be something like, that's the place where you learn to take it to the streets. I hope. That's my dream. I'm really into the on yeshiva as unsitting and therefore standing up. That's very cool. So I guess we're going to have to reorient our Zoom screen so that we can all be like standing. You, well, you I always use am. a standing yeah. desk, so we're yeah. set on that front, but I will have to, I'll have to invest. Okay. So I, I did want to give a little bit of a looking forward, a little sneak preview of where Judaism Unbound is. The, the podcast part of what we do is going to be going in the near future. And I, I actually think that our next set of conversations, our next set of like units gives a good encapsulation of some of what we want to continue doing. There are many taboo issues in American Jewish life, and we've touched on pretty much all of them, or at least tried to. Israel, Palestine, intermarriage, the biggies, God, etc. We haven't had a unit about circumcision. We are going to. That's coming up soon. And I am really excited about that, both because I think that's, it's just sort of a a slippery topic that people – it's not that I think everybody is like actively against talking about circumcision. I think mostly it's just like, oh, we don't want to talk about body parts. And But turns out circumcision and its role in Jewish life is really something that we need to consider as we do all of this learning and unlearning together. So that's one place that we're going. We're also going to be exploring a, a unit on food, Jewish food from different angles. 
appropriately because historically circumcision actually goes with food because there's always, you know, bagels afterwards. Just like at the wedding, there's the, the ritual and there's the party. So we're going to do food afterwards with some amazing guests, guests that will help us think about Jewish food more expansively. And we're also going to be featuring, precisely for the reasons we talked about in this episode, our own listeners and even on Yeshiva students to talk about ways in which Judaism Unbound, they've sort of taken and channeled into creative things, multiple of them in the context of Shemitah, the sabbatical year that, you know, we've been shouting out throughout this year. Um, for those of you who listen really closely, you've heard me whisper some notes about Shemitah at the end of our episodes in some little post credit scenes. But uh, that's a little bit of a window into where we're going. Um, we are about to close this episode out, but Dan, I'm going to pass to you before we do. I wanted to close by reflecting. I, I know that uh, there's, you know, Lex, you're into these kind of uh, word games and spiritual things with numbers and words and things. And so I was thinking about the 300th episode in mm. Jewish numerology, which is gematria. The idea that every Hebrew letter has a number attached to it. So Aleph is one, Bet is two, et cetera. And you could take any number and see which words you can make out of the the number. And uh, so I looked up the number 300, which as far as a letter goes, that's shin. So you might want to make a little bit of spirituality out of that. I don't have a shin thing here, but I was interested that there were a few uh, other words that, that were interesting that have that same uh, value of 300. One is minhara. That's like a tunnel. Uh, so, you know, or uh, some kind of channel. Ma'amakim, which is depths. Uh, so a channel for the depths. Or Ruach Elohim, the Spirit of God, is also uh, 300. And the last thing that I just wanted to note is that the word Arel is 300, and that means uncircumcised. So it does connect to what you were talking about in terms of where we're going uh, moving forward. I, I don't know exactly how much we want to hang our hat on that one, but uh, I did think that there might be a little bit of uh, the Spirit of God speaking to us uh, through this number. The biggest moment of, of today is that Dan, of of deep, well, I'm, I'm not going to overstate it, of deep opposition sometimes to numerology and woo-woo and mysticism and all of that stuff that I do occasionally like, um, has brought Jewish numerology to Judaism. That's amazing. Yeah, I I will have to think on those 300s. I, I don't have a go-to shin teaching. Um, I do think we should think about shin guards. Um, <laughs> Ruach Elohim. Wow, I can't. Dan Liebensid, who is not a God guy, just invoked the gematria, the Jewish numerology of Ruach Elohim, the, the spirit of God. That's awesome. Okay, so we're going to have many more unexpected twists and turns in our next 300 episodes, I am certain. Maybe Dan, before too long, will be a, a meditation practitioner and an herbalist. We'll, like, all of this is going to happen really soon. But until then, we hope that you will be in touch with us, and there are all sorts of different ways that you can do so. There's our Facebook and Twitter and Instagram handles. All of those are Judaism Unbound. There's our website, JudaismUnbound.com, and there are our email addresses, Dan at JudaismUnbound.com or Lex at JudaismUnbound.com. As Dan mentioned at the top, we definitely encourage you to leave a review for us in whatever podcast listening device you are using. So head to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you can give reviews. Give us a five-star review. We appreciate those. And of course, we do appreciate financial donations for those who are able, which you can do at judaismunbound.com slash donate on either a monthly recurring basis or just as a one-time gift. The final note is that support for this episode of Judaism Unbound comes from the Ashman Family JCC in Palo Alto, California, whose vision is to be the architects of the Jewish future. The Ashman Family JCC empowers you to experience Jewish paths toward a life of joy, purpose, and meaning through innovative Jewish learning and wellness programs, community building, and initiatives to develop the next generation of Jewish leaders. Learn more at www.paloaltojcc.org. So with that, whether this is your 300th, your 30th, your 10th, your 1st, your 5th episode of Judaism Unbound, whatever it is, for Sparta, no, this has been Judaism Unbound.